also back on the court tonight against the Sacramento Kings. Griff, we know net rating is one of your favorite stats. How telling is it that the Warriors have the lowest net rating they've had over the last five years this particular season? I don't think terribly so because if you would have spotted someone at this time in the year, the injury situation they would have dealt with, the inability they had to get Draymond and Steph on the court together, I think you would have had to assume that it wouldn't look very good. What concerns me about it, though, is that this team doesn't have the depth it had even last year. So they're going to have to continue to get incredible production from the starters and hope that somebody steps to the fore on the bench. That team is really missing, and I think one of the reasons the net ratings suffer so much, they are really missing the vertical spacing element of Damian Jones and or JaVale McGee. Mm -hmm. And in the absence of those guys, they need to find it because it's really difficult for their offense to flow as smoothly if you don't have to honor the dive. You know salaries better than me. How much did the Lakers pay JaVale McGee? It's a great question. I don't know the answer. No, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a high salary, It was right? not a lot. Sometimes you never miss a good thing until it's gone. I think JaVale McGee was taken uh, for granted to a certain degree. Uh, he obviously has shown that if given more opportunity, he can play out. He can stay out there on the court. They never really believed in him, and now they truly miss him. I know Damian, they, Damian Jones played that role for a while, but when you have an athletic role like Damian Jones, JaVel McGee, or for Houston, a Clint Capella, guys like that, when they screen and roll, they mean so much to your team offensively because they activate the weak side of the defense. Those guys roll down the lane. Weak side defenders understand, I have to meet this guy early and up in the lane or else he's going to be dunking on my head. You don't have to do the same thing with guys that aren't quite as athletic. You can rotate to them later. But when those guys have to rotate up the lane, what that does is it creates those passes to the corner. It creates guys cutting back door for lobs. It creates a lot of ball movement on the weak side. And you miss that when guys like JaVale McGee and Damian Williams are not on this team. Throwing the fact that Draymond Green, when, he, when he's struggling shooting the ball this year, it really means they're struggling at the five spot. So you're saying minimum for Jamail McGee was money well spent? That's what he makes, a million five. Wow. Yeah, that's crazy. Ba basically, uh, they, they, didn't, they didn't realize they had a good thing. And JaVel McGee is, he, I'm not going to say he has a lot of haters, but JaVel McGee has been miscast. And a lot of people think that he isn't intelligent or he, can, he isn't this and he isn't that. He's been cast a certain way. I play with him. He's very intelligent. He's a hard worker. He's a good rim, he's a good rim runner. And now he's gotten great coaching, and he does what he does well. And I think that Golden State messed up by not bringing him back, especially at that low of a number. Well, and they may, they may have wanted to. Maybe he wasn't willing to play in Golden for minimum, and he felt better Maybe about he, the Lakers situation. Did they have more than the minimum? I mean, may, I, hey, listen, I, I'm not saying pay the man uh, $25 million, but did you have three? or <laughs> Did you have $5 million for JaVale McGee? <laughs> he was well, a major part of your championship team. They and, didn't even match Patrick McCall now yeah. because it was $11.6 in space. I will say this, going back to JaVale, in the NBA Finals, he had some very impactful minutes on the defensive end when he would switch the screen and roll. He was sliding his feet very well with LeBron James. Well, we know that Golden State, it's defensively that they've struggled a little bit more this year as opposed to offensively. The Kings and Warriors, both in the top five in scoring and pace this season, on average combining to score over 230 points a game over under. We're going to see 230 tonight between these two teams. Blue Horseshoe says take the over. I'm going with Griff. I'm going over as well. I don't know who Blue Horseshoe is, <laughs> yeah. but I that, think that like that you know who what that you're your, talking about. Is that your bookie, Griff? <laughs> it's, a, it's a movie reference. We'll fill you in on it later. Okay, is he betting on the Bucks or the Raptors? That's the interesting question tonight as those two teams set to take the court right here on NBA TV at 8.30. Mavericks, it's their first game since a report surfaced that Jimmy Butler is having issues with Brett Brown about his role in the 76ers offense. Butler sat out Wednesday night's loss and is out again tonight. Griff, stop me if you've heard this before. Jimmy Butler not happy about his situation. Why is this different than any other time we've heard this from Jimmy Butler? Well, if you've just suspend the fact that it's Jimmy Butler. You don't think about what's happened to him historically in the past to get to this point. This specific episode is not that unique. This happens often. Mm -hmm. Players will challenge coaches in meetings during film, etc. It just doesn't get out. 
To me, what's significant about this issue is not that it's Jimmy saying he's uncomfortable with the offense because I would bet Jimmy's had conversations with Brett Brown where he shared these thoughts privately as well. He's probably told Brett when he came over, look, I run hot. This is how I work. I'm really competitive. I'm going to burst out once in a while. Come back at me the same way because I know he wants you to push back just as hard. What's meaningful to me is it got out. And that, to me, is representative of the fact that there's been some discord there already. They've already had issues with the fit of Joel and Ben Simmons a little bit. They've had issues along the way where people aren't necessarily happy with the fit and role. And when you're 25 and 14 and you're playing as well as they're playing, it's unusual to have that level of discontent. I agree with you. I'm a little bit worried that it got out. Um, but we've seen the situation before with Jimmy. Some stuff has got out. My biggest thing that worries me, though, is this is Jimmy's third stop. Normally in baseball, they say three strikes and you're out. And he's had problems, whether it be with young players, coaches, other star players, at every single stop. There was rumors that him and Derrick Rose had a little bit of a riff. Same thing with him and Carl Anthony Towns and Wiggins. Now we see this here uh, with the coaching staff. The, uh, we see the situation with him and Embiid a little bit. See what they're going back and forth. I just see a, a lot of smoke. And for somebody that is going to be up for a maximum extension, you would think that Jimmy Butler would be on his best behavior. If I'm some of the other teams in the league and I'm thinking about throwing max dollars at this guy, that has to be a red flag. I have to start to consider maybe this isn't the guy. Maybe I go after somebody that's less talented but more um, tolerable in my locker room because money just makes you more of what you already are. This guy has been here six weeks, and he's already cutting up, talking about he needs the ball, challenging the coaching staff. What do you do and what do you think is going to happen if you give him $200 million? He might cut a slam full. No, and I, I think that's true. And certainly because it's Jimmy, you do take into account the history. But I do think it's incredibly common for these conversations to take place and for players to be uncomfortable with their role, particularly when the fit of the pieces is as wonky as it is in Philly. Everybody wants things to be a little different. You remember earlier, Joel was not happy that he was playing so far away from the rim. And the reason they were doing that was a la Brooke Lopez, they were trying to open the floor for Ben. So there's already those seeds of discontent. So what Jimmy then ends up doing is he makes the situation seem much worse. But I think there have been several times in the league where you thought it was a brush fire and there wasn't even smoke. And if it wasn't Jimmy Butler, I don't think this is even a story. But because it's Jimmy, that's the story. And to me, the story is it got out and they're unhappy winning this much. I don't know. It's just, it's just, it just doesn't sit right with me because he had the problem with Carl Anthony Towns in Minnesota and who was the guy. And the, now we see the situation here. I can't be used like, whoa, 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 whoa. When you're not the guy, you have to figure out how to play with the guy. It's the same thing that we experienced in Cleveland. Kevin Love was not happy with his role. He didn't challenge uh, Blatt. He didn't challenge T. Lou. He eventually figured out how to play with LeBron James because he was not the best player on that team. I don't know if Jimmy Butler has gotten that memo that Embiid is the best player on that team. But Kevin, and that worries me, once again, if I'm another team or if I'm a, a GM thinking about throwing this guy money. Like, if you're the Lakers and you're going after Jimmy Butler, is he going to get in line with LeBron James dominating the ball out here? Like, these are all the questions that you have to ask yourself when you bring Jimmy Butler in here. He is costing himself money by the day. Yeah, and I don't disagree with the costing himself money thing. If it gets out that Philadelphia does not offer him max, it will be a very bad sign. And other teams around the league will wonder what's wrong. And they will agree, well, this is a problem for Jimmy. But if Philly is going after him full bore and they're offering him max, I think that will be something that teams sort of mitigate. And Kevin Love, you're right. He wasn't initially comfortable with his role, and it took him a long time to find peace with what was being asked of him. He was still voicing it. It's just that he had a different style of doing that. He approached it differently. You have to know that Jimmy's going to be a guy who's going to be all fire and come at you direct all the time. That's who he is. So, again, if he had not had the issues he had, I don't even care that he's uncomfortable where he's at right now. It's fine. But to your point, because he's done it so many times, he could potentially cost himself money if he doesn't eventually assimilate and be somebody who helps them win basketball games. I just think that one of my favorite boxers is Miguel Cotto. And he had a line when he was talking to another fighter. He said, 
And every fight I was in, I've always known what side I was, whether I was the A side or the B side. I don't think Jimmy Butler realizes sometimes what side he's on. He's the B side. He's acting like he's the A side. You can't come in here talking about, hey, I want to be used this way and I want this, that, and the third. This is Joel Embiid's team. You need to do things in a more diplomatic type of way. You need to talk to Joel. You need to figure out how we're going to play together. But you have to understand, everything runs through the big fella. And I don't think that Jimmy Butler is all the way on board with that. So, Brendan, we have fully explored Jimmy Butler's side of this. But you see the Brett Brown quote on the screen. I didn't think it went over the line. If it did, I would have addressed it. He has okay? to say that, though. So for Brett Brown going forward, the rest of the guys on the team, whether it's Joel Embiid or Ben Simmons, the other people he has to deal with, is this something that may hamper his job going forward if Jimmy Butler is able to speak out in this way and there's not repercussions? No question. We don't know if it went over the line or if it didn't. But here, let's just say for Devil's Advocate, it went over the line. He's officially just lost that locker room because he didn't, now no one respects him. If it went over the line, and people think it went over the line. And then he comes out and covers and says, oh, no, it didn't go over the line. It's okay. And he doesn't check Jimmy. Now people think you're soft. And now what happens, the ripple effect is when Brett Brown wants to yell at Landry Shamit, he's going to be looking up be like, you don't talk to Jimmy like that. Don't, don't come at me all hard don't, with all that fire. And coaches slowly but surely, the trust erodes away, and people just start looking at you like, yeah, whatever. And that's what happens, and that's part of this as well. Jimmy has to understand when he does this, it's not just about Jimmy. That's part of the problem. I think he's living in a Jimmy world, and he's only thinking about Jimmy Butler. He's like the NBA's version of Antonio Brown. <laughs> we, we talked about this when they brought him in. They were absolutely increasing both their ability to be really good out of timeout late and design some things that opponents can't deal with. And they were also really incre increasing their volatility. And Jimmy brings that 100%. There's no question because of how hot he runs. I look at this, though, and I think a team that's this good, they're 25 and 14 overall. They're playing at a very high level in general terms since Jimmy got there. When you come into the season with the expectations they had, and the only thing that's going to spell success for you is making it to a finals or at least an Eastern Conference finals, you're either all the way with me or you're all the way against me. So where this becomes interesting is come trade deadline, if they've got people in that room that are against them, they need to act on it because that's the one thing that unequivocally derails the season. This kind of thing is adversity, which is opportunity. You galvanize from this or you get radically worse, but at least it reveals something to you. Where this becomes actually meaningful and I liked his quote saying what he said, but what be when this becomes actually meaningful is, A, if you're right about losing the locker room, which certainly I don't think you can say he's done to this point, but if they're not all the way on board with what's being asked of them as a team, then Elton Brand's going to have to start to jettison some of those pieces who aren't. And that's when this becomes intriguing to me. Well, that's the problem. I think the piece that you're talking about is Jimmy Butler. <laughs> Wow, and they just acquired him, what, 21 games ago? It was all good just a week ago. Mavericks, one of those games, uh, one of eight games tonight. Also, the Raptors, Bucks, this game we're waiting for 8.30 right here on NBA TV. That guy, Nikola Jokic, had himself a game. Highlights coming your way. Round three between Milwaukee and Toronto. The first two games between these two teams felt like a heavyweight championship. Well, tonight feel the same way. Let's welcome in Matt Velasquez from the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel for more insight. Bucks became the first team in NBA history to have 12 different players score eight or more points in Friday night's win. What does that tell you about the depth of this team? I mean, the Bucks just have a lot of guys who can uh, who can fill in, put the ball in the bucket, and do it in a lot of different ways. I mean, they were throwing out kind of weird combinations. Obviously, when you get up by as many as 46, you're trying to, you know, keep everybody fresh for the back-to-back -back and, and throw different players out there. But no matter who they put out there and, and what the combinations they had, you know, guys were moving the ball well, trusting each other, and uh, and finding ways to score. And so, you know, that, that deep level of trust, uh, being able to translate up and down the lineup, you know, is definitely a positive for, for Milwaukee so far this season. It's one thing for that to happen in a blowout win, but a lot of teams rely on their best player to take the last shot at the end of close games. With the Bucks, we've seen that's not always the case. Outside of Giannis, who does this team have the most trust in taking a late-game shot? You know, I, th I think if it's a last shot of the game, especially if you need a three, you'd probably see the ball in Chris Middleton's hands. Uh, they've, they've done that a couple times so far this year. Um, if it's 
crunch time and they need somebody to create something off the dribble, then you you know, you might see the ball in Eric Bledsoe's hands, maybe running a pick and roll with Giannis, and then kind of creating off that. You know, he he had a bunch of games early in the season where he was doing some things uh, in the last few minutes of uh, of close games to help them close it out. But Giannis is still you know a pretty good closer in his own right. You know, he's shooting a high percentage uh, in those crunch time minutes, uh, getting a lot of dunks, getting to the free throw line. And, uh, you know, in recent games, you know, he's, he's put down some jumpers, too. So they have a lot of options, and you can never count out. Obviously, Brooke Lopez, you know, chucking up 30-footers and, and kind of cutting, uh, cutting teams deep uh, with those shots. There are so many positive stats surrounding this team right now, but the one that matters most, they've won nine of their last ten, approaching a halfway point of the season. Are they all starting to feel some of the weight of Ray's expectations because they seem to be playing loose? Yeah, I don't think so. I don't think they're really uh, affected by that. I think they, they've really kind of hunkered down and can, kind of kept that game at a time mentality, as cliche as it might be. Um, I, I think it kind of helps that you know we're here in Milwaukee. This is this is a smaller market. This isn't New York. It's not LA. It's not it's not Chicago or Golden State or any of those other places where maybe the microscope would be you know a little bit more heated. But uh, you know for them they're they're just kind of playing loose, having fun, you know doing what they've been doing all season and just kind of rolling as the winds come through. And it looks like that train is just going to roll through the season. Matt Velasquez, appreciate your time. Thank you. All right, appreciate it. Well, Philadelphia will take the court at 730. Jimmy Butler will not be on it. What are we going to learn about Ben Simmons and company against the Dallas Mavericks? We're going to chop it up next. Thank you, Mm. No chance.